dear guests, thank you for joining me uh, in this conversation with the IB. Uh, my name is Jaime. I'm a software engineer working for Microsoft. I'm, uh, also, I serve as the uh, VP of uh, content and activity in Career Up Club community. Uh, in this career chat, I will interview IB on many topics such as uh, consulting, uh, management, MBA, and so on. I hope you all enjoy this as much as I do. Um, so a brief intro, Ivy is a close colleague of mine who also works at uh, Microsoft as uh, Prince of, uh, principal PM lead. In our day-to-day -day work, Ivy has been the most energetic person who is uh, always uh, welcoming, open-minded, sharp and humorous, demonstrating the Microsoft leadership principles, which I learned recently, which is uh, great clarity, generate energy and deliver success. And my boss said, quote, Ivy is the best PM I have worked with. So <laughs> welcome Ivy, please say hello to our audience. Thank you very much, Jaime. Uh, I, I really appreciate that that very, very uh, flowery intro because uh, <clears throat> you know all the all the money I paid Ivan to to say that is is well worth it. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's uh, it's my pleasure to be here. I'm, I look forward to interacting with you and with the the, the people that we have on the call today. And uh, yeah, hope hope uh, I'm able to share some insights that will be helpful to everyone in their journey. Absolutely, thanks. So uh, before it all starts, uh, please kindly note that uh, our conversation only stands for our uh, personal opinion. It does not stand for any organization. So please uh, stay informed, consume with caution, and please do not record as I have already recorded or review our, our the recording with the IB after uh, before publishing. So today, um, so is Wilson here right now? All right, uh, probably he uh, is not available because he's really busy. Um, so I will also um, provide you, uh, am I sharing my screen yes, anyway? You. Yep. Okay. So um, today, first I want to uh, give you a, introduction of our agenda. So I'll start with uh, actually reintroducing Korea Up Club. Then I'll let IB share more stories about uh, himself. Then we'll go deeper into the conversation and uh, we'll leave some room for Q&A at the end. Um, during this uh, talk, uh, if you have any questions, please use the uh, Slido link uh, that I will share momentarily um, to uh, raise your questions or give a thumb up to the questions you like. Um, actually, let me do this right now. Uh, let me post it in the chat. Um, so let me first introduce you uh, who we are, Korea Up Club. So, uh, okay, sorry. Um, Korea Up Club is a 501c3 nonprofit organization founded by a group of professionals back in 2019 aiming towards building a strong community of professionals and helping each other to grow in terms of uh, building your trust network, technical and non-technical skills, get some uh, inspirations, et cetera. Now we have exp expanded our existence in Seattle, Bay Area, Austin, and uh, some cities across the East Coast. So our values are integrity, ownership, and growth mindset volunteering for the community, diversity and inclusion. You're, you're able to see my screen, right? Okay. Um, so what we do, we have online talks on Thursdays at seven to 9 p.m. PST. We also host uh, offline networking events such as barbecue, hiking, etc. Not to mention that we have uh, specific programs like uh, these uh, bi-weekly managers meet up, the mentorship program, and we have a leadership fire chat. So all in all, this is the community of uh, growth and fun. Uh, me personally, I think I enjoyed uh, both. Um, you can visit us from our website at koreaupclub.org, which will have the link to our YouTube channel, LinkedIn, WeChat, and Discord. So just to give you a, a feeling of how it looked like. Uh, we are putting our post and recordings in um, YouTube and LinkedIn. 
So since um, August is the giving month for Microsoft, I want to mention that as a nonprofit organization, we rely heavily on donations. Many companies, as we know of, such as Microsoft, Intel, Google, Oracle, LinkedIn, have this uh, donation match or volunteer hour match. So please consider supporting us by visiting your company giving portal and search for Create Up Club. And a special event uh, as part of uh, the giving campaign for Korea Club, we have uh, this uh, event planned. It's called Hiking with Students, uh, scheduled on October 16th at Snoqualmie Falls. So we did this in collaboration with uh, uh, CENUDAP, which is a University of Washington student group. Um, we intend to ex expand this into a HCL program series, namely Hike, Connect, and Learn. So please join us for a morning of hiking while building the connection and the providing mentorship to young professionals and to students. It's a great way to make new friends and guide students navigating the corporate world. To register, please uh, scan the QR code. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, it's also uh, posted in the LinkedIn channel. So you'll also be able to see this poster here. So please take a look. We appreciate you for taking time to help. Um, we probably also need uh, volunteers who can provide a ride to students. Um, if you are Microsoft or LinkedIn employee, you can file this as your volunteer hour match in your company portal. For example, I think Microsoft employee for one hour, there's a $25 of a volunteer hour match. Yeah, cool. Um, we appreciate uh, every donation and every hour for your support to us. Mm, okay, um, without further ado, let's get back to our main topic. So let me introduce you my colleague, IB. As many of you might have seen in the post of uh, today's event, IB is a principal PM at Microsoft. Um, actually, let me pull this out. Before joining Microsoft, IB worked as uh, McKinsey as an engagement manager for over four years, during which he helped transform the multiple corporations in their IT, HR, finance, product departments, saving which amazingly hundreds of millions of dollars. He had also an MBA degree focusing in strategy and general management in Fuqua School of Business, which is ranked as one of the best business school by US News at Duke University. Now, please uh, join me to formally welcome IB. Um, welcome here, IB. So would you please tell us a little more about yourself? Fantastic. Thank you very much, uh, Haiming. I'm, I'm super excited to be here. Um, <clears throat> very happy to hear about the, the great work you and your club have been doing. Uh, and I'm, I'm thrilled to be a part of it uh, today. So um, as I mentioned, I'm a principal PM. I, am, I work out of Microsoft, uh, out of the Redmond office. Uh, my, <clears throat> my core area of focus is uh, to keep Azure and other services like Bing and Office and Xbox uh, secure every month, right? So um, we are responsible for rolling out operating system updates to all of those different uh, systems. Uh, using uh, you know cloud services um, to keep those services pro protected and productive, right? Now um, I've been at Microsoft now for for just over two years, so two and a half years now. Um, and before my my time at Microsoft, I used to uh, work as a consultant at McKinsey and Company. Uh, I was there for about four and a half years. As as Hyming mentioned, worked on a, a number of different projects um, at McKinsey. I think the average project length is about uh, two months, two to three months. So if you can think um, over a four and a half year period, you'd have the opportunity to work on probably about 10 to 12 different projects, right? Um, and these are typically you know, uh, projects at different uh, uh, clients and you're working with them on typically very different problems, right? So I've uh, uh, Hyming has, has uh, listed some of the, the projects that I've worked on, but <clears throat> you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's, uh, it, it's significantly more than that actually. <laughs> it's uh, because you work on so many different initiatives, um, I would say in addition, uh, part of the McKinsey model is that you know when you learn when you work on something, you also look to impart some of that knowledge to other teams, right? So so you have the opportunity opportunity to drive even more impact in that way, right? So um, uh, you know uh, obviously McKinsey and Company, fantastic company to work at. 
you it's it's got a lot of uh, development opportunity and you will definitely uh, come out a different person compared to what you went in uh, to McKinsey with, right? Um, prior to McKinsey, I was a uh, I, I did my MBA at, at uh, Duke University at Duke School of Business. There, um, while I was doing my MBA, I, I actually interned at Microsoft, where I did uh, product marketing for a product called Power BI, uh, which is a data visualization tool that we we use at Microsoft, and it's one of the best selling one best selling products uh, all over the world for data visualization. Um, that uh, it was a fantastic internship. And uh, I, I love my time at, uh, at Duke University as well, at, at Fuqua School of Business. Happy to talk about that as well. Uh, the MBA is, is not an easy, um, you know, doing the MBA itself is not an easy decision to make, right? Because you're, leave, you're leaving behind a typically a successful career before you make this decision to go and study an MBA. Um, but, you know, I made that decision uh, and um, I've, I've not regretted it for one, one minute after that, right? It's been, it's been a fantastic ride after that. Um, uh, and then, you know, before my time at, at Duke University and the Fuqua School of Business, I, I was a software engineer in my previous life, right? I used to work on uh, as an embedded developer at uh, across uh, multiple industries. I worked in uh, on set-top boxes in, uh, in South Africa. I worked in the military as well, so working on... Um, on tanks, so the military tanks, writing software for the tanks, and then writing software for for um, for the defense side. So uh, you know, for for uh, for tanks to de to detect when they are being attacked, right? Um, so lots of embedded software development in my in my past, um, and then you know, in between, I worked at a bank. I worked on blood glucose meters. So lots of different uh, companies that I worked at as a, a software engineer before I decided to, to make this career switch and, and go into you know, consulting and then product management um, you, you know, uh, through, through, the, through the MBA, right? Um, so yeah, uh, Jaime, if you can go to the next slide. So that's, that, that was a little bit about kind of my life um, from, from a professional perspective. From a personal perspective, it's, uh, it's also a very uh, kind of um, you know, rich background. Um, my, my my parents are originally from India. Um, I was but I was born brought up in Africa. I grew up. I was born in Nigeria and grew up in in South Africa. Um, and then you know, as I said, moved to the U.S. in uh, 2013. Uh, I'm married and have two uh, two wonderful kids. Um, uh, the, the kids' names are Michael. He's he's 12 years old. He's going to grade seven. And then uh, Timothy, who's seven years old, he's he's going to into grade two. Right. Oh, he's he is in grade two. Sorry. Um, so yeah, my, my hobbies uh, include you know playing playing uh, games with my kids, uh, mainly online games like uh, Clash of Clans and and uh, games like that. So mobile games and uh, those type of uh, kind of less lesser involved gaming. Um, and then we uh, we love watching reality shows like uh, Survivor, um, uh, a very popular TV show, and then. Um, there's also a, 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 a TV show called The Genius, for example. It's from from South Korea. Uh, it's a fantastic program as well. So it's it's a little bit of um, reality TV where you there, there's a little bit of strategy involved in in all the the, the moves that people are making. Uh, those are the type of uh, you know uh, content that I, I find quite riveting, right? Um, and then you know from a from an exercise perspective, I try and. Uh, I, I'm not one of those people who likes to, you know, work out by myself or anything like that. I'm by nature a, 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 more, a more competitive person, so I like playing games like uh, squash or or ping pong. Um, but uh, these days, because because we're we're pretty much at home most of the time, I spend my time, you know, on walking around with the kids or you know going on hikes and things like that. Right. So that's a little bit of background to my uh, my life and career so far. Um, happy to you know answer any questions as as pertains to any part of that. Cool, thanks, Abby. I think um, the general image you have, uh, uh, like you gave me, is uh, very dynamic. I think <laughs> like uh, the Clash of Clans for me is like a more. I think it's the less engaging for you, but uh, back then I think it's kind of engaging game for me because I need to practically build some uh, clans. <laughs> anyway. All right. Thanks, Avi. Um, yeah. So uh, let's uh, 
first, I, uh, so we will uh, go through this. Uh, I prepared a, a bunch of uh, different topics and uh, different uh, questions mm -hmm. um, for our dear audience. If uh, any time uh, you have uh, you are interested, you can use the link that I sent over the chat to uh, raise your questions, and I'll send them again. So let me. First, let's uh, uh, start with some uh, uh, more general questions. So uh, what books do you read or any podcasts do you listen recently? Sure. So uh, in terms of um, books and podcasts I listen to, so I think uh, books, as you know, we just launched a, a library at work. So Yeah, that's uh, fantastic. <laughs> yeah. So... Uh, one of the books there uh, is a book uh, is uh, there's a, there's an author called Marty Kagan. So he's written a couple of books on on products, right? And uh, oh, okay. So I've, I've read some of his books. Um, in addition, there was there was actually a, a product management course that that McKinsey uh, conducted, right? Uh, they did it uh, for their alums, right? So um, so they reached out and said, hey, if you're if you're interested in product management, we've got uh, we are interviewing key people in the product management space, right? Um, they even included some uh, some people from Microsoft. They included Marty Kagan himself, the author of that book, right? So um, it was uh, like a leadership series on on product management, right? And so that was the the like the podcast that I, I listened to most recently um, was just you know listen to the, listening to these leaders talk about you know what what is uh, what are the key learnings they have from their lifetime in the product space, right? Um, mm. So from these, I think you know, some of the key takeaways that I got were um, the incredible customer focus that that those people uh, showed all through their career, right? And it's it's a lot for us to learn from, because in many cases we think to ourselves, oh, I I know what the customer is is thinking, I have a mental picture of the customer, and in many, many cases we fail to actually talk to the customer because of that, right? Uh, and um, you know the the one learning from there was always, hey. No, you should be talking to at least one customer every week, at least two or three customers. Just pick up the phone or go to where they are and talk to them and, and just understand how they're thinking about things. Right. So interesting. Cool. So uh, do you mind if you uh, share the name of the author and the book uh, in the chat? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I'll do that. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm thinking like while we're talking, I'm thinking that, uh, you know, I think there are different types of leadership. Uh, definitely talking with like as a, PM, the leadership uh, behavior of a PM probably is uh, uh, one of the uh, important side is to talk with customers. Mm -hmm. So yeah, I think um, that uh, is, uh, you know, it's more for this uh, out, like extroverted person. And there are some, uh, uh, you know, I think in our org, there are some uh, uh, leaders, they are kind of a introvert person. So it's really interesting to uh, observe this uh, different types of uh, leadership styles. Okay, jump to the next question. Mm -hmm. um, what does a typical day look like for you? Uh, do you have any routine, uh, like uh, workout, watch news? Sure. So I think um, earlier, you know, I had a lot more time to, you know, you know uh, work out, watch news and stuff like that. Uh, especially uh, when, I, when I was a bachelor, <laughs> I think um, I used to play basically almost a different sport every day, right? I'd play squash, soccer, table tennis, um, uh, you know, lots of different sports that we would play every day. Um, these days, you know, now that I'm settled with family, it's a lot more routine. So, uh, you know, in the morning, you know, getting kids ready for school, dropping them off at school or at the bus stop. And then uh, my day typically is, uh, you know, from from like nine to five ish is is a whole lot of meetings, right? It's yeah, um, uh, it's it's very seldom that I have like an hour or uh, or more free all through the day, right? There's there's always um, meetings scheduled or there's always ad hoc meetings, right? Mm. Uh, from from whatever the latest kind of crisis is that we have, right? So mm. um, there's always meetings all through the day, and then. Uh, you know, so in between uh, the day, you know, stop to get some lunch uh, somewhere. So uh, typically if it's work from home, I'll just, you know, go to the, the fridge and grab whatever's there. Um, my wife is a fantastic cook. So uh, I'm, you know, because of that, I, I keep getting fatter. But, uh, you know, there's always healthy food as a result. Uh, and then uh, normally around five-ish, I try and kind of uh, shut down a little bit. So, um we start like uh, shutting down or kind of moving away from work start focusing on on stuff at home so you know uh getting ready to 
um, help the kids with homework, uh, you know, uh, pre preparing dinner and things like that, right? Um, so that you know we can get get that the nighttime routine into into place. Um, on occasion, if it's if I, if it's been like a really hectic day and I'm really tired, I might even just take a power nap at that time, right? Um, I really I really believe in like the the power of sleep, and so uh, that a half an hour of sleep that you have in between is like sometimes a phenomenal value, right? Um, and then normally, uh, so normally the evening is all about kind of the family life and making sure that everything's in place and then uh, everyone's ready for the, the next day. Then after the kids go to sleep, then it's like, okay, fine. We, I, I get back to my PC and, and kind of work for another uh, hour or two, depending on how much uh, work I have. And then, uh, you know, shut down and, and go to sleep. Okay, very interesting. Uh, Follow-up question. So yes. describe your power 30 minutes uh, of rest. How does that uh, recharge you? My power nap? Uh, so my power nap is basically, um, you know, so typically when you're, um, when you're when you're going back to back to back, right? In, in lots of meetings, you're, you're being challenged in different ways, right? Because inevitably these meetings are different people. The questions being asked of you are different. In some cases, you're trying to understand what they're even talking about, right? So you're, you may be doing research in the background, trying to understand what they're talking about. Uh, inevitably, you're having conversations on the side. So there's a lot of, lot of different management um, that's happening at the same time, right? Yeah. Um, and then, you know, ultimately, you need to communicate with, with your stakeholders, make sure that everyone's on the same page at, at all times. So there's a lot of, like, hand-holding that happens every day. Yeah. So th that inevitably takes a lot of effort, right? And you're, you're, um, you're kind of sometimes a bit uh, emotionally drained at the end of the day, right? Absolutely. Yeah. And so in that, in that sense, sometimes, so that's, that's one side of things. The other thing is sometimes, sometimes you have this like uh, challenging problem, right? Um, maybe there's some, uh, some person you're trying to get to that they're trying to explain something to you, but you're not understanding it, or you're trying to explain something and they're not getting it. Right. Uh -huh. um, and you're, you're not quite sure how to, how to solve that problem. Um, in those cases, you know, I've, I've actually found that, you know, half an hour taking a power nap, right, at, the, uh, at some point, uh, your brain still, you know, while you are resting, your brain is able to process uh, in, the, in the background, right? And in some cases, it, you'll come up with a solution, like as you wake up, you find it suddenly figure out, wait, I should have done this. This is what I Absolutely. should have done problem, right? Yeah. So um, that's how I found like power naps to be reinvigorating, both from a problem solving perspective, as well as from an energy perspective, helps you rest. And then when you come back, you're able to then, you know, have a fresh perspective on a problem or uh, attack, you know, whatever you need to get done with um, renewed energy. Yeah, I can't agree more because I feel like there is a more and more popularity on in this, uh, uh, like, uh, breath work to so to speak i uh learned recently this uh something called uh, uh non-sleep deep breath uh, to basically uh take a walk and have some uh, uh deep breath you know maybe 10 deep breath and um maybe just for five minutes outside in the walk that can um shut your busy brain down for a moment and uh, you feel that uh you are a little different after you come back mm -hmm. so um in your LinkedIn, you describe yourself. Uh, you, you are, of course, you are a product manager on Microsoft Area. You are experienced Microsoft uh, uh, management consultant uh, mm -hmm. with uh, multiple uh, engagements in businesses, and you have an MBA uh, focused in uh, strategy, uh, general management from Duke University. So, regardless of uh, the different titles. So mm -hmm. what essentially do you think is the core of your profession, your skill set? Um, yeah, it's a good question. So I'd say the core of my skill set is um, one, one is uh, one is obviously strategy, right? Uh, so you, you, you know, working, working on, um, on, and uh, I would say strategy uh, encompassing like problem solving. Right, so solving problems is basically what what drives me. Right, uh, I'm someone that, uh, from a personal perspective, I love solving pro uh, puzzles, and uh, you know, when I see a problem, inevitably I feel the urge to try and solve it in some way. Right, um, so that's something that drives me, and it's something that I'm I'm reasonably good at. Um, so I'd say strategy and problem solving is one. The second piece is on uh, technical leadership. Right, so technical leadership in terms of uh, product or program management. 
which means you know being able to understand you know working with engineers is 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 quite challenging sometimes right because uh like you guys are super sharp right and you understand the technical details about the the little issues that you will have down to the nth detail right um and i'm, I'm sure you you also uh you know understand that sometimes you know the, the the information you have is down at the the lowest level, right? And it takes a little bit of, of work to get that up, to boil it up, so that it's it it makes sense that we can share that with leadership or with customers, and they are able to make sense of of the the information we're sharing with them, right? And so um, that piece of technical leadership and being able to communicate you know significant technical changes, right, in such a way that everyone's on the same page, everyone understands, okay, this is what's actually changing. This is what's the impact of, of this work that we're gonna be doing, right? And they they come along for that for that ride, right? So um, so that, that encompasses a little bit of, you know, change management, of course, right? Because you need to be able to convince people that, you know, hey, what we're looking to do is in, the, in their best interests. Uh, there's, there's significant business justification for this, et cetera, et cetera, right? Um, from a soft skills perspective, I'd say, you know, one of the key facets of, um, of this type of profession is is being able to have um, uh, to show leadership without authority, right? Um, you know, I, I don't manage a lot of people, right? Um, the, the people I manage very recently are are two other PMs, right? Um, the, I don't manage any engineers. I don't manage any of the 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 people who are producing components that are used by our team, right? However. You know what we need to do is basically work with those other teams to make sure that we are all on the same page, that we are able to deliver together to uh, to achieve what we want to deliver, right? And so leadership without authority is making sure that one we as an engineering and PM team are aligned in terms of what we want to deliver, that management, so our leadership, is bought into that vision that we have, and then our customers uh, also buy into what we what we want to uh, where we want to go, right? So that we we don't develop um, product features that that our customers don't want, right? That would be ultimately wasted effort. Fantastic. We well, can I elaborate more um, uh, more cases. So, um, flashback. Um, tell us a little more about your childhood. So, you said you were born in Nigeria. You grew up in South Africa, yeah. and uh, your parents are Indian, and you moved a lot. Um, yeah. So what does this uh, diversity of uh, cultural background give you? Do you think uh, uh, compared with uh, just another person, um, what does, advantage does, does that provide you? Yeah, very good. So I think, um, yeah, you're right. You know, uh, you know, born in Nigeria, yeah, you know, was there for nine years, then, you know, 20, 20 something odd years in, 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 uh, in South Africa, right? And then, and then moved here. Um, my parents were both, uh, as you said, from India, but they were both teachers, right? Uh, they moved around in Nigeria and South Africa, mainly because of like uh, political issues. Um, however, you know, one of the things about, you know, having teachers as your parents is that they, they always emphasize the importance of, of education, right? The importance of studying hard. Um, so even when I was young, you know, uh, from, a, from an early age, they would be like, uh, you know, after school, okay, let's come and let's let's learn some more. Let's study some more, right? And so, as a result, you know, because of their teaching, I, I even skipped a couple of, of grades when I was when I was a lot younger. Um, I, I started uh, because of kind of the, the schools uh, near where my parents lived weren't weren't amazing. I started living away from home when I was ten years old, right? So, um, uh, living in like a boarding boarding room type thing, uh, living with another family type thing um, from when I was ten years old and. So that that had its own its own challenges, right? It's always it's always good to live with your parents, uh, have that um, kind of uh, support always that you can count on. Um, so at times it was challenging, but you know overall I think you know it made made me a, a more tougher person, if you will, and uh, more used to being able to connect with people and being able to um, get along with people who I meet for the first time, even right. Um, I would say you know. Uh, in terms of what that what that's meant to me, yes. Uh, so like, as I said, you know, being able to connect with people very easily, it's also good because you know, from Nigeria, from South Africa, from you know, uh, Duke, and then McKinsey, you know, all these different experiences in different countries, in different industries, it all it always gives you kind of a fresh perspective into how pe how different people are thinking of different problems, right? Uh, so uh, when you when 
you can say, hey, you know, um, this. Uh, you can you can show someone this and say, hey, what do you see, what do you think of this, right? What what do you see when you see this, right? Uh, something abstract, of course. And uh, <clears throat> you know, five different pe five people will come up with five different interpretations of of what that is, right? Based on their background, where based on where they come from, right? And so uh, I find that very very uh, intriguing. And so it's one of those things where hey, when, when, we, when we do the work that we do, right, especially with the global companies that we work for, right, it's, we, we, have to we have to think of that as well, to say, okay, well, you know, this feature that we're working on, how would this uh, be interpreted by someone who is from a different cultural background, right? Uh, so I, my, my point is that when, when you're looking to solve problems, uh, when you're looking at uh, communicating, um, this this diverse background that I have, I feel helps me in understanding the different perspectives that people bring to the table, right? Uh, and it helps me value those uh, the contributions of other people on the team as well, because I, I understand that they have different perspectives from mine as well. Yeah, I think mm, I well said. I, I cannot agree more uh, because me so I think I have uh, some. Uh, um similar like uh, when i was a child i uh me and my parents we we moved uh, to like different places as well i think definitely that uh, challenges me to be of course be tougher and to uh uh to to be, be able to cope with new situation and i think after i i moved to north america definitely my like uh, previous like mm, solid uh, these uh, opinions have uh, loosened quite a lot, and I feel like myself has uh, been uh, compared with probably five years ago even uh, a lot more open minded than before, and I think that's a good thing. So now let's fast forward to your adulthood. So mm -hmm. in your resume, you took a college degree majoring in electronics. So is there any particular reason? Ah, interesting. So uh, electronics, I actually went to a university um, and started off uh, studying mechanical engineering, right? Uh, from, from when I was in school, I, I always loved math. Math was my, my top subject always, right? Um, uh, my, my father was a math teacher. And so because of that, I knew that I couldn't mess up in, in math. Any other subject, it was fine. <laughs> but math, I, I, I had to do well in. Uh, so I always, you know, worked a little harder at math. And, you know, if you work hard at something, you become good at it. And then you you feel like working harder at it. So it becomes a bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy, right? Where uh, that, that, that loop becomes positive, 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 until the point where, you know, I absolutely love math and everything to do with it. Um, and so, you know, it was a natural, you know, um, course after school to do something that was related to math. So engineering was one of those uh, professions where I thought, hey, this is something where it was great application of, of math and, and uh, physics and those, those that, that core um, type of um, subjects. And so I went into university and started doing mechanical engineering. Um, and when I started mechanical engineering, they, they actually had like one of the courses they had was kind of like an immersive course where you did a little bit of you know, electronic engineering, a little bit of uh, different types of engineering. So you saw what the different you know engineering uh, disciplines look like right and uh when i was there you know started working on a computer basically for the first time right um i'd worked on a, a computer mainly to, as in i'd played games on a computer before but i'd never actually you know done work on a computer before right so written, written software and you know tried to solve a problem uh you know written an algorithm you know all the whole you know learning different types of loops and and syntax and and, and those type of things um, problem solving the problem solving exactly right and so once, once I discovered that, honestly, I, I, you know, I was hooked. I was like, I didn't want to do anything else. I was like, okay, this is this is what I want to do. This nice. is just phenomenal. Uh, I love this this work. I would I could do this uh, all day, right? And so, um, yeah. So signed up for for electronic engineering. Uh, it was it was challenging. Uh, you know, uh, the the education system in South Africa is is very different to the to the one in the U.S. I think. Um, my, my in terms of just the different the, the support that you get is very very different right um, oh yeah so uh, i would say in undergrad um and maybe this is a difference uh, between undergrad versus graduate school I, i'm not sure but um in my undergrad it was like oh you'd get a lecturer that came in there gave a lecture and left and then you were a little bit on your own to try and figure out what what is going on right oh Whereas yeah in in <laughs> in graduate school it seemed a lot more like 
you know, the, the person would come there, the, the, the lectures were typically a lot more interactive, right? They cared a lot more about you grasping the material. And then after that, there was, there was, there was countless um, additional opportunities. If you had, you know, further questions or you wanted to interact with the lecturer in some way or form, they were, they were always a lot more open for you uh, interacting with them, right? So it just felt a, a little bit different. I think it's also because you know when you were an undergrad you had very different priorities, right? Um, whereas when you're in graduate school you are you're typically a lot more mature and then you care a lot more about you know the content that you're learning. Whereas in undergrad you're just like, hey, I just want to you know uh, go to class. Okay, fine. After class, let's let's go and find something fun to do. <laughs> yeah, I think that's a, a excellent way of uh, going through undergrad, just to uh, in a playful manner. Yeah. So just <laughs> out of curiosity. Uh, yeah. Is there any point in time, uh, like especially before, that you are uh, uh, any like interested in literature or philosophy? <laughs> <laughs> literature or philosophy? Uh, like I said, you know, English. I, I loved reading, right? I loved reading. I loved books. I um, I remember when I was in school, I used to read something like the, the small books. I would, I would read something like three or four books a day, right? Wow, a fast it, reader. A fast reader and like and another thing I did is I I didn't believe in doing homework right it was uh, not recommended but <laughs> I didn't like in school um, I had a very interesting approach which was that you know if you didn't do your, your do your homework you went to school and uh, the teacher would would uh, take a cane or a, or a ruler oh, yeah. and and hit you with it to punish you for not it's doing universal homework. yeah exactly right and so I looked at it and said well okay there's what eight different subjects right if I don't do my homework uh, every day, I will go to like each class. I will go and I will get you know eight different uh, hits on my hand, right? But but the benefit of doing that is that I you know my entire afternoon after school is hundred percent free. I can do whatever I want, right? So I saw it as a you know here's the investment that I need to make to keep my afternoons free. Is I will take eight shots from eight different people. <laughs> And I'll be okay with it, right? And so very early on, I made that trade-off and I made that decision that, hey, I'm not going to do it. Um, so, but as a result, I had a ton of, uh, of free time for, for reading. And so when I was small, I would read uh, three to four books every day. I would, uh, after school, I would go to the library. The, the librarian knew me more better than, than any of my teachers or even the people that I stayed with because I spent so much time in the library, <laughs> right? Um, so yeah, uh, it's, uh, you know, it, it was an interesting experience. Uh, I would say, you know, um, I, I wouldn't recommend it, the, the, especially not doing homework part. But uh, otherwise, you know, uh, that that natural inquisitiveness is something that that um, that has stood me in good stead uh, since then. Oh, cool! So, any any books you still uh, have any uh, memory that uh, has some lasting impact in you since the time? Uh, I mean, there's there's so many different books. I think. Um, uh, from a fiction perspective, I think uh, one of my favorite books is probably uh, there's actually a movie coming out soon of, of it. It's called uh, Shantaram, S H uh, A N T A R A M. Uh, I'll, I'll share it in the chat as well. Um, but they're they're uh, adapting it uh, to the to the big screen. It's actually on, uh, releasing on Apple TV sometime soon. So looking forward to that. Um, cool. Yeah. Otherwise, you know, from a uh, from a nonfiction perspective, there've been there, there've just been so many books that I've that I've read. Uh, you know, at at different stages, I'm one of those people where you know if you know when when I when I was looking to do my you know uh, learn pro what what is project management about, I I got a book on project management, right? And I I read about it. Okay, I understand. Okay, here's the principles of that. When I was getting to uh, do the MBA, uh, for, to prepare for the MBA, you know. There's books that people have written in terms of different approaches for GMAT and things like that, right? And then there's obviously the GMAT books and all that stuff as well. Then in terms of the MBA itself, you know, there's books that you can read that that help prepare you for the MBA, right? And for recruiting. Recruiting is always a, a huge challenge when it comes to the MBA, right? And so there's different books that you use at different stages in your in your in your life, right? Even for for product management, there's books that I'm reading right now. There's books that prepared me to get into the product management uh, space, right? So uh, there's no one book that I'd recommend. I'd say there's there's many books that have helped me get here, and each of them has been very very topical for that for that point in my life. Cool. Actually, I just borrowed, as you know, that uh, the OKR book by John Doerr that uh, yeah. you you shared in the our library. Yeah. Uh, that I, I've heard it for a long time, um, but I haven't had a chance until you uh, bring it up. 
So it's actually a fantastic read um, mm -hmm. because it combines this uh, um, very uh, exciting history of uh, like big companies like Google yeah. and the uh, methodology of uh, this uh, different mindset of uh, OKR. And that com also combined with uh, some of my, of my own recent thoughts in terms of uh, uh, your strategy, your tactics, and your uh, execution. So mm -hmm. I feel it's a very fascinating read. I, I love these uh, methodological books, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. So um, next question. So mm -hmm. during your uh, especially early years in career, you worked as an uh, engineer implementing software and integrating with hardware. Mm -hmm. um many fields mm -hmm. and you frequently uh, change your jobs so actually uh i, I noticed that you, you spent four years on your first two job first job and then yeah. two years second one year third and eight months eight eight months on the fourth yeah. so what, what is the motive yeah i think um in some cases it was um you know uh, in some cases it, in most cases, it was always it was about developing yourself, right, and challenging yourself in some way or, or, or the other, right. Mm -hmm. um, in some cases, it was it was actually forced, where you know the company was was shutting down or it was merging with another area, and the future was uh, was kind of uncertain. So just okay, at that point, you're like, well, I, I don't I don't need this uncertainty in my life. I'll move to somewhere else where it's a little bit more stable. But by and large, you know, my my choices in terms of um, you know moving companies has been driven by the opportunity to, to drive bigger impact, right? Um, so initially I started off as a, as a software engineer, as I said, um, you know, writing embedded, embedded uh, uh, software for a uh, set of boxes, then, you know, working on tanks, uh, working on, on defense systems. And then, you know, slowly, uh, you know, I, I started getting feedback that, hey, you're, you're fantastic as a software engineer, right? Uh, but we also see that, you're you're a little atypical from the, the 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 usual software engineer because you actually really really love hanging around people, right? Uh, so, like when I was at at, uh, at various companies, I would start uh, lots of different clubs, right? So I would start you know um, squash clubs or um, you know ping pong to tournaments or uh, you know so like all, all these different social activities or cha or charity you know um, you know uh, walks or runs or, or, and things like that right so always some kind of activity to bring people together right and and uh, kind of uh, create that team spirit within the, within uh, within people right um, so I remember I remember one of the the, uh, the best pieces of feedback I've, I've ever gotten from a from a leader was uh, was that I his his exact words were, were uh, you have a latent ability to energize people, right? Uh, just simply by by you being in the room, people are are just energized. And when you leave, like uh, you, you can see after a little while, the energy in that place kind of dies down a little bit, right? Uh, obviously, that's that's feedback that that's phenomenal and not something that I would ever I would ever know, you know, unless someone tells you that. Um, but you know, the, all those uh, you know the mentors that I've had and uh, and th that kind of feedback. Help guide me to think. Hey, listen. You know, from the software side, yes, I'm able to to drive some impact. But you know, maybe that that bridge between the technical side and the customer is somewhere where I can play a, a more active role, right? And it would it would kind of be a little bit more uh, aligned to my my skills and and my you know driving force. Uh, and so start I started looking at opportunities to get more more from the the, the engineering side to the you know to the the customer side, right? And so that's Going through the product side or the the project management side, but and so that that's that was kind of one of the drivers for you know looking to do you know uh, business administration type um, courses, right? So I did some courses in South Africa as well uh, on spec writing and technical writing and and that type of thing to help me kind of uh, move into that space, uh, and then you know finally the the MBA that helped me kind of uh, bridge that that final gap, right? Uh, I would also say you know from a I've told you before, I'm driven by problem solving, right? And so typically, you know, it, it takes you, when you're in a new job, it takes you probably uh, six months before you're you're really a productive member of a team, right? And then, you know, for, for the next, you know, one and a half years, you're probably delivering good value to that team and to the workspace that you're in. After that, you're, you're pretty much like, you know, you know, most of the things that, that are important there, right? 
Um, and then, uh, you know, I, I'm one of those people who naturally starts getting a little restless where I'm like, well, what's what's next? You know, because uh, this so this problem, I understand this problem. I understand how to solve this problem. Uh, I, I'll even lay out how, how to solve this problem. Even if I'm not able to solve it, the person after me will know what they need to do to get this done. Right. Um, and then, you know, let me find something new to, to, to go and kind of stimulate myself from a work perspective, at least. Yeah, to echo with you, I think, um, so I'm kind of, I consider myself as a spiritual person. I, I believe that there's, you know, different people, they have this uh, different uh, energy level. Yeah. So you definitely, when you, I definitely, when I sit or talk with you, I feel kind of, uh, uh, there are sense that I feel uplifted because you are always uh, so energetic. Um, yeah. Thank you very and, much. I, I, tr I try to be positive as much as possible. You know, um, we, we, you know, one of the things that is that uh, we should be very grateful for everything we have, right? Um, if you compare kind of where we are right now compared to the, you know, the other 7 billion people on the planet, right? We, uh, there's a lot of things that are going very well for us, right? Absolutely. And so, so where, you know, some, you may have had a bad day, you know, someone may have even shouted at you and said, you're horrible at something. Okay, that that's an opportunity for you to learn, for you to get better, right? That's still probably better than, X, num X billion number of people on this planet, right? So um, every day is kind of, is, is a blessing. And so we should we should look at it in, in that form. Yeah, I sometimes also have this uh, proactive, uh, like wishful thinking to uh, think positively. Uh, yeah. Definitely uh, it helps to, uh, when you think of, uh, you know, how big the universe is and how long life is, that helps yeah. to uh, cure some of the anxiety. So, but I think there's still uh, some difference uh, from individual to individual. Uh, so how, uh, if you reflect on yourself, uh, how do you, uh, what do you think that uh, level of uh, security, that uh, level of energy come from? Is it uh, um, like inborn, like, or from uh, uh, how you grew up or you work on, work on yourself to uh, keep that level of energy? Yeah, I think, you know, so you know with regards to you know that that perspective on you know looking positively at at most things so like like i mentioned you know we we've come a long way to where we are right now you know um there were uh, times when we were when we were going up growing up in in africa where you know one of my parents only had a job right uh, as a teacher the other uh, parent was out of work uh, and in, in many cases it was a little bit of a struggle right we lived in some cases, in a in a two room house, right? Uh, when I say two room house, I mean two rooms. There's no there's no uh, no toilet, no bathroom. It's literally just two rooms, right? Um, mm -hmm. And uh, the toilet is 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 like a uh, hundred meters outside. The there's there's no washroom, so you basically have a tub and you you take one of the rooms and you go there and you you have a bath in there by yourself. Um, and th there was a huge, you know, um, spirit of perseverance there, right? My 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 parents, you know, no matter how bad things got, they never ever showed us that hey things were bad. They would they would always be like, hey, you know, things are things are still positive. You know, we, we're at least we're all still together. We, uh, you know, God has still provided so many things for us. And so <clears throat> that that positive attitude of, of looking at the brighter side of things is is definitely a, a values thing that I I got from my parents. Right. Nice. Um, there's also the perseverance factor. Right? Like I said, um, you know, we didn't have a bathroom, we didn't have a toilet or anything like that. My father listen, literally, you know, went and uh, he walked around. He saw some pieces of wood that nobody was using. Right. Your father is problem solving. <laughs> 100. Right. And he he saw these pieces of wood that nobody was using. He asked around. They were like, "Yeah, nobody's using this this wood." He took it and he went and he built a shower. Right. He built a shower outside our house. <clears throat> so that so that we didn't have to you know take bath inside the house we could go outside and and, and take a shower right and there's, there was no um there was no uh kind of um electricity in that split place either right and so uh it was still a manual shower but but at mm. least you know he, he solved whatever problems he could right um so the, the lessons there are, are 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 key to you know the, the person that i am today right in terms of you know perseverance problem solving um, and then always having a positive attitude, right? Because no matter how bad things get, it's always like, hey, you know, there, there is still some finite finite way to solve this problem, right? And, um, you know, 
I, I'm very lucky. The people that I work with, especially you, people like you, Hyming, are some of the smartest people I've worked with ever, right? And, um, you know, so I know that there's no problem that's going to be too difficult that's uh, for us to solve, right? And so I know, hey, even if I don't come up with a solution, I know that I'm with a, a great group of people who between the, 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 the 15 people here, will be able to come up with a great solution that's the best for, for Microsoft and the best for our customers. Well said. I, sometimes I think that, uh, you know, the, this sense of, uh, you know, great sense of uh, security, um, it impacts your uh, decisions a lot. So mm -hmm. this fundamental characteristic um, will sometimes make a difference in like how you uh, decide on uh, your working style, like you uh, prefer to uh, more trust in yourself and work alone or uh, really leverage other people and uh, to uh, trust in people to deliver great results. So mm -hmm. I think that's a great point. So um, before we move to uh, the next session, so um, so it, uh, in I think in when you were in uh, South Africa, you uh, your last position was uh, a manager uh, for a media broadcast company. I think yeah. and you also notice uh, the largest uh, uh, media uh, broadcast company in in Africa. Yeah. And so, how do you recall that experience? So, mm, how uh, what what do you like uh, and probably uh, do not quite like about it? And, uh, and most importantly, what was the reason that you make this uh, really big decision to uh, uh, pursue an MBA degree in another country? Yeah, so I think <clears throat> uh, if I think back on my time at Model Choice, it is probably um, probably the, ha the uh, probably the happiest time I've, I've ever had at, at a company. Right? Um, it was uh, I, I was managing a team of, of thirty engineers. Right? So you could uh, think of me as a uh, my role was as an engineering manager, and mm -hmm. I, I had 30, 30 engineers uh, reporting to me. So think of this as I used to do. Um, you know, performance appraisals and feedback for 30 people every yeah, year. Yeah, you run a lot in, about that experience, I can tell. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, <clears throat> I would say um, I absolutely love that company uh, and, and the people that I worked with, um, all fantastic people. I, I'm still in touch with many of those people to this day, right? I'm still in WhatsApp groups with them. We still keep in touch. We talk about, uh, you know, funny experiences that we had when we were working together. Um, you know, things that I loved was that uh, the the leadership team was fantastic, right? They they were very very supportive of the engineers that we had, right? They they backed us in 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 many many cases, right? Um, and th so they had a lot of faith in us, and we always delivered as a result, right? Um, so it, it was it was a great experience. Uh, I learned a lot about kind of you know putting your faith in people, trusting people, and and uh, you know empowering people so that they are able to deliver their best self at work, right? Um, you know, from a, uh, you know, if it, if it weren't for my multi-choice experience, I would, I would not be here, right? Because the, the, the leaders that I had at Microsoft, uh, at multi-choice, the people that I worked with, they were the ones that wrote the rec recommendation letters for me to, to do and to go and do the MBA, right? Um, so I'm not sure if you're aware, but as part of the MBA process, you need to uh, submit essays that talk about, you know, yourself and your, the work that you've done and how you've been able to drive impact. Uh, but you also need people around you to say, here's what we know about Ivy, right? Here's how what we think of him, right? Um, and those have to, to, to also be written well. They have to show uh, some, some level of, you know, um, maturity from that person, right? Uh, and because it's, it's very easy to, to ask your manager to write a recommendation letter. And you don't see the recommendation letter, by the way, right? So they can submit it, they can submit it, and they can write whatever they want. So they could write, "Hey, this person is horrible," right? Because they oh, don't so want you to have no visibility into that process. Exactly right, and so oh, they could write that. And so if they, if you if you get recommenders that they tell you, "Hey, they're going to support you," but they don't, you know, your your career prospects are harmed as a result, right? You're you're never going to get into the MBA, uh, the dream school that you were you were targeting, right? So, mm. so that in that way, you know, multi choice very much made me the person that I am because uh, the leadership team there, you know, saw the saw the potential that I had, right? And rather than saying, hey, we want to hold on to him and uh, make him, you know, continue to work at multi-choice, they were say, they said, hey, you know, uh, you know, there's a classic saying, if you love someone, you know, set them free. And then if they come back to you, they were, 
when they're, they're yours. If they don't, they were never, it was never meant to be, right? I think in some cases, you know, multi-choice, you know, set me free with the, with the hope that, you know, maybe I some, someday go back and, and work there. It, you know, never say never. Maybe someday I do go back to South Africa and work at multi-choice. Um, but yeah, all, all, always kind of uh, pleasant uh, thoughts in my heart about, about multi-choice and my time there. Uh, in terms of, you know, actually making the decision to, to leave, though, uh, a lot of it was driven by by looking at, um, you know, where I was in my in, in that, that stage of my life, right, which is, you know, married, we had one child, and I was thinking of, hey, what, where's the best environment to, to raise the child, right? Um, South Africa is a fantastic place. Uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful country. I would heartily recommend to anyone to go and, and visit there. Um, the people are phenomenal. You'll you'll have an amazing time, and and the dollar goes very very far. The South African brand is 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 pretty weak, and so uh, you'll get uh, kind of the best of South Africa at a, at a at a fraction of the cost to your pocket, right? Um, however, one of the challenges that we have in South Africa is the the crime rate is very very high, right? And um, and we've been affected by crime uh, a couple of different ways. You know, my my father was was um, hijacked a couple of times. He's wow. uh, we, we've been mugged a couple of times. Um, <laughs> it's certainly uh, so chokingly. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, it's it's one of those things that, you know, at the time, you know, it's obviously not uh, not uh, something that you look look uh, look back on, that, that you're, you're, uh, you, you view as anything positive. But looking back, you're just, you know, one, one, you're just thankful that, you know, nothing happened, that it wasn't, you know, there was no, no, no permanent or lasting damage, right? It was, it was just, you know, someone came and stole something, they took some personal property of yours, but you know, ultimately, that's property. That's something that you can replace in the future, right? There was no lasting damage as a result, and so you're 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 thankful in that sense. Um, but ultimately, I got to the point where I was like, "Hey, you know what? I don't want to continue staying here and, and raise my ch children here because um, I want to give them the best chance, and I feel the best chance would be overseas, right? And overseas, and either in Europe, uh, Australia, or you know, Canada or, or, or United States, right? So I started looking at, at various MBA schools and um, thinking about, you know, how how I could set us as a family up best for success, right? And, um, you know, after lots of research, decided, hey, uh, an MBA at, at a US school is probably the best way to go about this. Um, and so, you know, then started looking at the different schools and, and what each school kind of represents. Um, ultimately decided that that Fuqua School of Business was was probably the best one that was uh, aligned with you know what I what I was looking to get out of a, a, an MBA, and so you know was lucky enough to get in and um, you know and and that that was the beginning of a, a fantastic journey. <laughs> cool. So uh, speaking of uh, your life, uh, like you you are uh, basically uh, I think it's a demonstration of uh, I think. Uh, uh, it's, you are the uh, you know you are the, the the father of a family. It's a great ownership, and uh, you have demonstrated uh, this uh, leadership. You know where we are going. So uh, that's uh, really uh, job well done. So when you moved to uh, US, starting your MBA life. So uh, how was your life when you first come to the states? Is there any uh, unexpectedness? Any culture shock? Um, yeah, I, for sure. You know, uh, when you're coming from from South Africa, which is, um, you know, as I mentioned, you know, the security in South Africa is not 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 fantastic. Um, you, you're always kind of alert in terms of how you're doing things, um, but you're also comfortable in where you are in South Africa, right? Because you have a huge circle of friends, you have a huge uh, circle of colleagues that you work with, and so you know when you when you move across and you are you come into the U.S. and now you are you're no longer, uh, you know, someone who's working. Now you're a student again, right? And so you're a student now, and then um, so you, you know your 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 day to day is very different, right? You you go into class, you're going to learn, and then you you're doing homework and things like that. So just the your day to day routine is is very very different. Um, but also like you know some of the things like. Um, you know, the cost of living is also significantly different, right? Where you, you, you used to live and earn in, uh, in rands and, and you're, you used to spend your money in rands, of course. Um, now you're, you're here and you don't have a ton of savings because all your, your savings and rands, you convert it to dollars, right? And now you're living off that. And as you're living off that, uh, you, you kind of uh, are uh, incurring expenses in, do in dollars. And that becomes very, very expensive, right? And so 
<clears throat> there's a huge culture shock in terms of, oh my God, the cost of living is so high here compared to, to what it was back home, right? Um, so that took a little bit of getting used to. Um, but, you know, ultimately, I think, you know, North Carolina and Duke University was a little bit more of a gentle introduction to the world, to the United States. Uh, like if we'd gone to New York or something like that, I think it would have been even more uh, exaggerated, right? Because, you know, cost of living and everything would have been a lot higher there. Uh, at, at, in North Carolina and Duke University, it was uh, fantastic. Uh, I think the, the environment they had there also was a good one, where they, they, they made sure that when families came in, families had the opportunity to settle down. They had uh, people that were there to show you around, to, so to help you understand, hey, here's where you go when you want to get this type of stuff. Here's how you get a driver's license. Here's how you get a uh, social security number. So they, they, they helped you get set up in terms of all the different processes. Um, uh, but yeah, you know uh, the the way things work at the you know, in the in the U.S. is just phenomenally different, right? Um, the postal system is 100% reliable. When someone tells you uh, the check is in the mail, the check is really in the mail. It's it's just guaranteed that you're going to get it, right? Um, uh, so lots of things are very different from how it was in South Africa. Um, uh, so yeah, uh, lots of culture shock from that. But you know, it's 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 also great to. <clears throat> Sorry, it's also great to to experience that as a family because you're you're all learning together and you're like, wow, did you do you see how this thing works here? And everyone's like, wow, there's, there's that <laughs> wow factor as you're growing through it together, and um, that's that's a pretty awesome experience, though. Fantastic, I think it's uh, you know it's like a, having somebody you love uh, standing by your side, so it makes everything so much more fun. Uh, yeah. Like as opposed to uh, you know, like a spin a musical and a bachelor life and very busy mba life so yes. <laughs> this is find a find a partner before you go um so if uh say uh if, if someone like me want to maybe someday want to go to uh like uh, uh mba school like uh like for example duke um Duke, so uh how, how do you think how much i should uh, prepare like the fund, fund wise yeah so um i think from a you know preparation perspective you know, one the first question I have for people is, um, you know, uh, are you are you ready to go back to kind of you know two years of learning, right? Because mm -hmm. right right now you're you know you go to work, you have a work routine where you are a productive member of the community, if you right of the the software development uh, community. Now you're going to go back and you're basically going to be a student, right? So when you go back and you're a student, um, uh, you you have to have that passion for learning, right? And that's that's where sometimes the first question I, I always ask is, have you done the GMAT, right? Because if you've done the GMAT, you you can't write the GMAT and get the good uh, a good score in the GMAT unless you've actually done some some learning yourself, right? You need to prepare for it. So once you go through the exercise of learning the GMAT, you should think, okay, from that GMAT experience, did you enjoy the GMAT experience, right? When where you had to learn by yourself, right? There's there's Sure, there's YouTube videos to help you in specific areas, but by and large, you you pretty much have to drive yourself, right? Now, uh, if you did enjoy that GMAT experience and you are uh, you're able to get a good score, then it's like okay, fine. Then you know that ticks a couple of boxes because that shows hey, one, you do have the passion for learning, and two, you have the aptitude in terms of you know especially the quant and the, the communication skills that you need for for the MBA, right? Um, <clears throat> You know, once once you, you do that, I would say one of the other ways you can prepare for the MBA is like uh, there's there's so many you know free co uh, courses online these days, right? So if you go onto Coursera or Udemy or any of these 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 portals, um, there are something like ten courses that are that are fundamental to any to every MBA program, right? There's um, finance, economics, marketing, um, strategy. Um, operations the uh, you know uh, accounting uh ethics and uh so, so th that was seven there's there's like uh, three others that that are are also or oh, leadership as well um and yeah uh, oh statistics as well um and then one more uh, that, that i'm missing somewhere oh uh, leadership communications so th these are like 10 fundamental co courses that that every mba program has Okay, it's 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 typically called called the uh, the core uh, courses, right? Um, the way that most MBA programs are structured is you, you everyone will do that those core courses together, 
And then after you've done those core courses, you'll branch out into different specializations depending on you know what area of interest uh, uh, you, you, your, your, your focus uh, is, right? Um, so <clears throat> the one advice I would give is go on to Coursera and do some of these, these, these courses, right? Do some of these courses on finance, on operations, on um, accounting. Just doing those courses will help you understand, okay, this is what the MBA is about and just help get your mind into the right space so that when you go into that place, you're ready to, to absorb that content a lot easily, a lot more easily. So I think, uh, yes, there are a lot of uh, free courses, but uh, let's think about it from a, a more like a goal-driven perspective. So if I'm a software engineer right now, uh, all the courses that, you know, from knowledge consumed perspective, I, I would love to learn, you know, different things. But if yeah. I don't have an end goal in mind, uh, like these things don't even have that much appealing to me. So so I guess my question is how, what, uh, like what, like as software engineer and, as a software engineer right now, uh, why do I think, why would I think that uh, this will help me uh, in a longer career planning perspective so that uh, uh, after reading this, I will be uh, ready, uh, you know, uh, maybe have some uh, uh, better prospect in my career, in my life? Yeah, so the other question for you is, is would be one of, hey, where, where do you see yourself going, right? Like your, your future, where... Like, do you see your future as being a one where it's technical leadership, where you're going to be a you know, a SWE and SWE manager, maybe either you know a technical fellow or um, you know a SWE uh, a principal like SWE manager type thing, you know, going up in the team leadership side of things, right? Uh, or staying in the in the technical specialization side of things, right? Uh, or do you see yourself going more closer to the customer or closer to the business side of things, right? So absolutely. I, if, if when you're looking at doing something like the MBA, um, if, if you're looking to go anything on the, the 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 technical leadership or the the technical ownership side of things, then an MBA, you know, while useful, is not is not a prerequisite, right? You can you can even do you know some of these part time MBAs or or things like that that'll help you kind of understand the content without um, without you actually you know taking the time off and and uh, kind of taking a pay cut and all that stuff, right? Um, if, however, you want to go to the business side, if you want to go close to the customer, if that's something that you're passionate about, then uh, you should consider doing the MBA, right? Um, you know, from the MBA's perspective, there's um, there, there, there's probably like, you know, uh, three things that, that that's going to be super valuable for you for, for the MBA, from the MBA, right? One is obviously the content itself. You're going to learn a lot of stuff, right? Uh, a lot of stuff that you have not been exposed to, right? Uh, so um, you before coming to the to Duke and doing the MBA, my knowledge of corporate finance was a uh, big fat zero, right? Um, and now, you know, I can listen to, you know, uh, analysts who are talking about, you know, uh, weighted average cost of capital of different companies and understand, okay, this is what they mean by that financial concept, right? And so learning those financial concepts and all these things have been very, very helpful for me. Um, <clears throat> so, um, so there's an entire world that's going to be open to you from this uh, learning opportunity that you have from ABA. The second piece I would say is the opportunity to uh, network with people, right? Uh, one, you network with, um, with, with professors, of course. So these are, these are people that have spent a ton of time in research, right? They, they write papers every year on kind of insights that they've gained from you know work collaborating with industry or from research that they do or experiments that they conduct right um at duke university there's a famous uh, university uh, professor called uh, dan Ariely, for example right and he he does lots of experiments on customer behavior right and uh, i think his courses are on coursera as well where you can go on it and you'll see some of the experiments he conducts right and you'll see hey um, if if you go if you go into a supermarket, for example, and someone gives you uh, there's a store there with like three different types of, of ketchup, right? Uh, <clears throat> inevitably, you find it easier to make a decision and and buy one versus if you go into like a supermarket and someone shows you a store with like 27 different ty types of ketchup, right? You end up going in there and you think, hey, more choice means you know the customer should be happier. But what actually ends up ends up happening is the customer looks at it, they see the 27 different choices, 
and they are so confused by it that they decide, hey, you know what, I'd rather not make a choice and they actually leave without buying. Right. So there are lots of like counterintuitive insights that that these professors uh, come up with that uh, help you understand human behavior, helps you understand uh, business, helps you understand the industries that, that you work with every day. Right. So you get the chance to interact with, with those professors. I would say also you, you get the chance to interact with your classmates. Right. So in, at Duke, there were four, uh, close to 450 other students in my in my year. Right. During the the two year period that I was I was at Duke, there was a four hundred fifty uh, group of there was a group of four hundred fifty students the year before me, right, and then there was a group of four hundred fifty students the year after me. Yeah, right. So in so, that two so in that two year period, I got to interact with one thousand three hundred fifty students across across those those two years, right. Um, when when I say interact with them, um, you know you're doing courses as you're doing courses and you're doing different electives you have the chance to work with anyone you want right and in the, so you work with specific uh, groups right and so i would always try and get in groups with different people right mm -hmm. uh, and so um i actually as a rule never work with the same person twice because I, I, I said, hey, at, to maximize my learning opportunity, I want to work with different people and I want uh, the opportunity to learn from different people in different ways. Right. And so throughout my, my two years, you know, after the core courses where you have to work with the same group uh, for the next like one and a half years, I basically worked with a, a different person every every in every in every class. Right. Um, so there's that networking that, that MBA gives you. And then finally, there's the. Um, you know, the other key opportunity that the MBA provides for you is the opportunity to uh, to to get uh, your foot in the door of a fantastic company, right? So, um, you know, as you mentioned, uh, Duke University is 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 world renowned. Fuqua University is a global brand. Uh, Fuqua School of Business, sorry, is a, is a global brand. And so, the employers that come to to Duke University and Fuqua School of Business are, uh, you know, the top employers worldwide, right? So. You know, McKinsey's there, Microsoft's there, Apple is there, Google is there, um, uh, BCG's there, Bain is there, Goldman Sachs is there, Morgan Stanley is there. Uh, like every company, the top companies in every single uh, kind of industry you can think of, they all recruit from these uh, from these top uh, business schools, right? And so you have basically an equal shot to get into any of these schools, right? Obviously, the school can provide the opportunity for you to interview there. But you know you need to perform in the interview, of course, as well, right? If you don't perform in the interview, it's it's on you, right? It's not the school's fault that you didn't do well. But um, I would say so. Th those are I think the, the 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 three key things that the school provides for you, right? One is like I said, the the knowledge. Uh, two is the um, the opportunity to network with both the uh, the professors you work with as well as the classmates that you have, right? And then finally the 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 opportunity in in uh, at a company of your choosing um afterwards right one other piece about the networking piece so as i said there's a thousand three hundred fifty people that i that i worked with right all these people are in different places right now like right? for example so for, ex for example google for example apple for example there's people that are back in uh in japan there's people that are in south africa there's people in uh in china there's, there's people in all different countries in all different types of industries Right when I was leaving McKinsey and looking for my next my next job, it was so easy for me to just reach out to be to to the alums that I that I that I started with and say, hey, um, I think there were like probably thirty or forty people that I knew at Google who uh, who went to Duke with me, right? And so when the recruiter asked me, hey, do you know anyone um, that can that can give you a recommend that can that can recommend you? I was like, yes, I can give you a list of thirty people who would who would recommend me. And you can reach out to anyone, and I am confident that they would recommend me, right? So uh, <clears throat> that's that's kind of the, the strength of the network that you have, because you know you work with people and you work well. Um, that network will help you not only in terms of you know job opportunities, but also when you are looking to partner with. So let's say, for example, you decide to go into startup, right? And you're looking for some financial uh, backing. You can you know reach out to your investment banker friends and say, hey. I'm working on my pitch deck. Here's how how things are looking. Can you give me some feedback so that I can you know make this even more robust, right? So this is the power of the network that 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 the MBA sets you up for. And um, yeah, 
uh, it's 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 definitely an asset that I that I that I hope to continue to leverage uh, throughout the rest of my career. That sounds very amazing. Yeah. I because for me, uh, business school is like uh, it's very distant for me, and uh, there are so many areas that uh, I have uh, uh, little to zero knowledge about. And uh, just to think about uh, opening up a business uh, facing the customer, so that's I I definitely have not figured anything out. Uh, on that scope but mm -hmm. uh, you know i think general i'm uh, i would consider like to consider myself as a modest person uh probably some technical leadership is uh, as of now is a better career path for me but mm -hmm. i'm definitely interested in people um in terms of uh, like knowing uh, who they are what their aspiration is mm -hmm. uh but definitely i think that's very different from the you know the business world of uh, getting to new york customers where this more given a sense of a massive, uh, you know, doing this uh, customer behavior research. So I, I think definitely there are more things for me to uh, figure out in the future. Um, but fast forward. So right after business school, you uh, mm -hmm. landed in McKinsey. So uh, McKinsey sounds to me like it's the uh, the Navy SEAL team of the uh, <laughs> consulting consulting. Uh, uh, industry in the world mm -hmm. so um so why not you start with tell us some uh, like exciting stories about working in McKinsey sure you know so uh, you know as, as I mentioned earlier you know McKinsey is uh, a phenomenal company right you you are, it's one it's it's a company where the greatest asset that McKinsey has is the people a hundred percent, right? Uh, with other companies, it maybe it may be the patents or the the the, the products that they have that uh, that's already built up significant significant market share. With McKinsey, you know, it's the consultants that drive the the impact that that McKinsey has, right? If there's no people, McKinsey has no product, right? Um, so because of that, you know, McKinsey is is uh, is an amazing place to to work. It's an amazing place to learn. Um, as I mentioned, the projects are, you know, six, uh, you know, the, the shorter projects that can be two weeks. Um, on average, the products, products are, pro sorry, not products, the projects are about uh, six to eight weeks long. You, you get the odd project that goes on for like six months, but that's very, very seldom. Um, nobody calls McKinsey in to, to rubber stamp something, right? So nobody, uh, in, 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 like, Nobody called McKinsey in to say, "Hey, can you come in and just um, kind of approve this, this uh, that that my my approach is fine, right?" It's not. It's not. It's never just a validation exercise. They normally call McKinsey in because they want to drive significant impact. Yeah, um, they want to drive significant impact in in the work that they are doing, right? And um, and so you always know that when you come into a place. You you're inevitably brought in by the CEO or the CFO or someone from the C-suite that's brought you in, and you you have the mandate to go and work as basically their their eyes and ears on the ground, right? And so that is a significant responsibility that you have as a as a McKinsey consultant. Um, <clears throat> you know the lifestyle is definitely one that is is very high paced, right? You travel. On a Monday uh, morning to to uh, to wherever the client location is, you fly back on a on a Thursday evening, um, and and the work hours can be a little hectic, but you know by and large you have the opportunity to drive very very significant impact, right? Um, and so you know uh, you work. It's also you know when you when you're in business school you you're trying to learn as much as possible, like I said, right? And <clears throat> going into management consulting after that is a, a phenomenal way to kind of experiment, right? And see, well, here's some things I learned at business school. If we try things like this at um, in this industry, right? What what how what does that answer look like, right? Um, so you have that opportunity to, le to learn in in various industries in various geographies. McKinsey also has a, a phenomenal um, kind of body of knowledge, right? There's a lot of there's like I think a thousand ten thousand experts or something that McKinsey keeps on on uh, as part of their their uh, workforce, right? These are experts on the most random things you can think of, right? From from pricing on airline tickets to um, to how to shut down a nuclear reactor, right? They have experts like I'm and I'm not joking. They have experts across all of that stuff, right? 
um, <clears throat> you think about it, they, they'll be able to find an expert on it. That they'll be able to help you think through the problem and think through that problem from a client perspective and how it applies to that client that you're working at. Right. So, uh, phenomenal experience. I'd say, you know, in terms of the excitement, you know, the, the uh, because it's such pro short projects, right? You always have like the, the McKinsey approach is one where you go in and you um, you almost you you <clears throat> from day, day day one you're building the answer and you say hey eight weeks from now what do I think the final answer looks like right and you go in with very very little knowledge to be to be fair right so you go in with very very little knowledge and you say my hypothesis is that you know this is the here's what the problem is here's what what I think the solution is and this is kind of our day zero or day one uh, answer. Okay, so <clears throat> that can be like a 30 or 80 page slide deck that you've, you've said maps out the entire answer from end to end for what this this uh, this um, problem looks like for our client, right? Uh, exactly. So define the problem and and um, and basically build that day, day, day one answer. From that point onwards, it's all about iterating and saying, okay, once we've defined what the problem is, let's now work with our uh, clients, work with the industry experts, do some customer interviews, base, get the, the different sources of insight so that we are able to pressure test the hypotheses that we have, right? And so conduct those experiments and so that you're able to come back and say, here's why we think this is the answer for you, right? So, <clears throat> um, yeah, so, you know, uh, overall, from a McKinsey uh, experience perspective, I would say like every single project there was exciting in one, one way or the other, right? Um, some of the more exciting stories, uh, I would say uh, there was one project where we got there and we were the, um, you know, basically the first consulting company they've ever worked with, right? And so they they came in and they said, hey, we don't know what, like they basically said, hey, we don't know what we're doing right, right now. Um, here's what we think. Can you like just spend some time, think about what we're doing and tell us, hey, what should we actually be doing, right? And so we went and we we analyzed like pretty much everything you could think of, right? In terms of, hey, here's where you are as a company. Here's the capabilities that you have. Here's the markets that you're in right now. Based on these markets, here's the opportunity we think you're going after, right? Here are some other areas that you haven't looked at. Here are some additional markets that you haven't looked at. Here are some additional products you should consider going into, right? Here are some capabilities you should think of, of building up, right? Here are some <clears throat> sorry, here are some sales channels that you are not harnessing as part of your solution, right? So these are all, and, and this was, I think, a, a uh, eight week or 10 week uh, project that we had. And in that eight to 10 weeks, we put together a comprehensive uh, answer for them in terms of how they will be able to, you know, harness, uh, you know, not just millions, but, uh, but close to billions of, of opportunity for, for themselves, both from a, from a cost cutting perspective, as well as a, a, a revenue uh, generation perspective for this company. So um, I know that uh, McKinsey, like yeah. and do this uh, research ex uh, as a matter of fact, um, the McKinsey, uh, some people say it's like the PhD of uh, MBA. So it does a lot of uh, research. So um, after delivering this uh, solution yeah. uh, and uh, when you deliver to the client, so it's up to the client to implement them. So uh, probably a very brief question is, do they actually deliver uh, what the goal of like uh, the the, the pre, uh, like uh, expected goal from this solution? What is the uh, like expectedness and uh, the uh, actual result? Yeah, so in <clears throat> um, it varies, right? It varies from 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 customer to customer, from client to client. I have been on projects where we've made a recommendation, and um, shortly after that, the key client, the key project sponsor has decided, listen, they're going to leave that company and go to another opportunity, right? And mm -hmm. so as a result, uh, the new people that come in, uh, come in and they they feel that, hey, they don't want to to uh, to try out these these learnings that we've, we've shared with them. And so as a result, kind of 
you know, nothing uh, continues from that point onwards, right? But I've also been on on in in places where we've said, hey, you're from from embracing this approach, you will be able to get X million of benefit from this, and they've been able to, you know, from from following that approach, and then you know, building on that, they've been able to get even two X that approach that that uh, that benefit, right? So it's a little bit of, uh, you know. Uh, that that's where the change management needs to be uh, a, a key component, right? Because unless you have, uh, so one one thing that people think is that you know McKinsey comes in, they 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 look at everything, they deliver a recommendation, and then they leave, right? That's that a, a stereotypical big, way of looking at it. <laughs> yes, that, that is that is a very very poor answer actually. What what McKinsey does, right, is that they make sure that they they build the capabilities within the organization as well, right? By like giving solutions. So, for example, um, there was there was one um, uh, utility that we worked with, right? Utility mm -hmm. as an, uh, so uh, an, an energy provider. Mm -hmm. So, with that company, they were looking at their um, their IT division, right, and how their IT division was uh, was functioning. Uh, their customer ratings for their IT uh, division was was not not very positive, right? And so we came in there and we said, okay. We analyzed all their tickets. We analyzed the type of work they were doing. And we came up with a number of recommendations in terms of the type of work they should do, the uh, almost the type of teams they should set up, right? The, uh, so one team that's focused on these type of tickets, another team that's, that's focused on these type of tickets, right? Uh, so that <clears throat> you know customer uh, throughput was going to be significantly higher, right? In addition, you know the IT department itself, within the IT space, uh, some of the people there were also frustrated at the type of work that they were doing, right? Because it was like, hey, someone comes and tells me I want this thing, but I get very incomplete requirements. And then I'm not able to, when I deliver a product to them, they don't, this is not what they had in mind. And so uh, they are frustrated and I'm frustrated. And so as a result, you know, uh, you know, the product doesn't go anywhere. And so, you know, nothing happens, right? So there were a lot of kind of these pain points that we came in and we looked at them and we said, okay, for this, we're actually going to uh, conduct uh, basically uh, a transformation, right? As part of this transformation, we want you to be part of the transformation with us, right? So when we were in the room, we had like key representatives from each of the different departments in the room with us as we were thinking about different solutions, as we were thinking about different problems, right? So that and then we would call the experts and uh, we would bring experts from all, from all over the world, uh, uh, pull them into to conferences, and we would chat together to say, hey, how do we find uh, opportunities to improve together here, right? And so what happened is that after we leave, you know, it's not, hey, or even during that time, right? When we came up with a recommendation, that recommendation was, was not a McKinsey recommendation, right? It was a recommendation that was delivered from the client team plus the McKinsey team, right? So, yeah. <clears throat> sorry. And so what happens is that, you know, once the McKinsey team leaves after that, the, the client team is still there. And so those people, you know, they put their names behind that recommendation too. So if, so they have a vested interest in making sure that that, that is successful after that, right? And so, they they continue driving that change throughout the organization to say, hey, this is the recommendation. This is why that that recommendation was brought there, right? So that when people have questions about it, they don't have to ask uh, kind of a McKinsey partner, hey, why did you guys come up with this recommendation? They can just ask this person that that's the in the office next door, and that person will tell you tell you them, hey, we spoke to that expert, and their perspective was X and Y reason, and that's why we decided we're going to adopt this model, right? And so that was very very powerful in making sure that. The changes that we recommend have lasting impact. And as a result, we are able to drive significant impact even after we leave. Yeah. So um, maybe some of our audience uh, is uh, unfamiliar with the uh, consulting industry. So probably I, I did a little bit of research today. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. I'm going to uh, try to uh, remember as much as I could. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. So basically, sure. the way McSean uh, is structured is like there is this... Uh, consulting like uh, doing this uh, performing the uh, projects uh, division so there is another track as a support office and the support office these are the bunch of uh, um, like support uh, like uh, you say like analysts or researchers that they specialize in different uh, 
small like areas of uh, fields and that they are they could provide data they could provide this uh, field research on a very specific area and uh, when you guys consultants um, you need the supporting knowledge like the data or the uh, and the, the research from like the general uh, that uh, area, um, this support team will provide you uh, mm -hmm. with this kind of knowledge. And at the other end, uh, you talk with customers, you uh, try to uh, know their pain points and uh, a sense of uh, where they want to go. Then uh, start from there, you have this, uh, like you said, this uh, hypothesis driven um, day one approach then you like make this uh, very uh, a methodology very uh, iterative that uh, um, you as you gather more and more evidence know more about the customer pains and then uh, uh, get know more about this uh, uh, like a, uh, field research from the supporting office uh, you test your hypothesis mm -hmm. and uh, sort of uh, uh, it, whether it's right or wrong then you you have uh, you know uh, next version, which is more probably more precise, of uh, the root cause of uh, a, either a problem or how to get a goal. Yes. So, am, am I right in that sense? One hundred percent. I mean, it's like you 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 are a lifetime consultant. You said you're very united. Thank you. So I think uh, one thing uh, from uh, McKinsey that uh, fascinates me is that uh, uh, consultants always get so exposed to uh, different fields and you guys need to learn so fast yeah. because uh, there's these different functions like the HR department, the, uh, uh, the finance, the uh, IT, um, there's this functional departments and also different industries. And uh, when you think of the combination of these, it's not like a solution fits everything. Yes. So definitely it feels to me that uh, you need to uh, kind of, yeah, it's it's basically uh, your how, how you deal with things, like this problem solving. Uh, you are getting exposed to a problem. It's a new scenario, different industry. And you know there is a huge resource that McKinsey is able to provide. And okay, now you are on your own. You are able, you should do like a neuron that connects the the knowledge, the support, figure it out, and find a way and present and deliver to a solution that is convincing enough for the customer, mm -hmm. for the client that uh, it's uh, is very likely to help them to re achieve that goal or address that problem. So that's my, uh, I think it's uh, my, uh, like a, uh, maybe 20,000 uh, feet high view of uh, the essence of job you are doing. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, <clears throat> I think, you know, like, like I mentioned, the the key asset that McKinsey has is always, always the people, right? The people, yeah. are, you know, by, by extension, the, the knowledge that those people have, right? So, uh, I mentioned the research, uh, the, the experts that we have as well, right? Uh, not me, I'm not there anymore, but <laughs> there are experts that, that McKinsey has as well. Um, Alumni. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, and yes, you, uh, you know, uh, make sure you, you validate whatever hypotheses you have in, in whatever way, way you can. Um, but yeah, like if, if you if you're interested in consulting, you can look at uh, you can look at kind of the the case uh, interviews that that McKinsey does, right? Uh, McKinsey, BCG, Bain, we all, they, they all do the, the case interview approach, right? And what that is testing for is one, your problem solving capabilities, two, your communication uh, capability, but three, you know, when you are faced with a new scenario that you haven't thought of before, how are you able to, to, to problem solve on the fly uh, and, and not look to boil the ocean, but, but have uh, an intuitive sense of where the problem could lie and uh, look to solve that problem. Yeah, absolutely. I think uh, it's that uh, intuition of, uh, I think there's the, uh, also a very famous rule, 2080 rule from like that yes. is part of this book. Um, and I think that's very fascinating too, because uh, the way it recommends is that, uh, you know, you focus on 20% of your energy and time and uh, that can deliver like 80% of the result, like, yeah. uh, or, or even more. Mm -hmm. So. Uh, if you are able to, uh, the, basically, you are you'll be at this uh, multiplier in, in in many fields. So I noticed that you, uh, so of course, you have uh, this uh, uh, technical and uh, management background mm -hmm. uh, when you start your career. 
And uh, so definitely that's the industry that you are most comfortable with. Um, so in your uh, cases, you, you did in McKinsey, uh, what, what are these, uh, like, do, do you have, uh, like, uh, uh, I think uh, in your career track, at some point, people, consultants tend to choose their, like, uh, fields, uh, industry, or function to mm -hmm. uh, build more expertise. So what, what was your uh, strength or your yeah. building? Yeah, so in, in my case, um, so I was part of the, the digital McKinsey um, uh, group, right, which means that typically uh, we solved, um, so if, it, if it's, a, the way I think about it at least was, uh, if it's a general company, right, um, a non-technology company, right, then our client was typically the CTO, the CIO, and we would be solving technical solutions for them, right, technology mm -hmm. solutions, like, hey, how do they uh, think of their, their online channel, right? How can they increase their sales approach, sales uh, throughput and things like that, right? That's, 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 the, that's the digital side of a non-technology uh, company. If it's a technology company itself, our client typically would have been the CEO, right? That's mm -hmm. the, I'm talking about the digital McKinsey part of it uh, because we, you know, it's a, it's a technology company, which means, uh, the the essence of the company is technology, so there's opportunity for us to advise across the entire uh, product uh, portfolio or uh, every other kind of division of the company. Right now, uh, in my space, in my in my my uh, experience, um, uh, inevitably most of my work was on the uh, in the digital McKinsey space was on transformations. Right, transformations being, you know. Um, uh, company, so you could get the odd company that's in trouble, right? So in, they're in trouble and they're like, hey, if we don't uh, cut some costs out, we are going to go bankrupt very shortly, right? So for those mm -hmm. companies, it's like going in and saying, okay, where's the opportunity for them to to cut costs? Um, and so there, you know, inevitably, if you have a choice of do you uh, focus on the the product related side of things or the the GNA functions, right? Well, GNA functions are the functions you spoke about, right? Finance, HR procurement, IT, et cetera, right? Um, marketing. Uh, so, uh, w so inevitably, you know, GNA functions are areas where you could reduce some, some cost and it won't affect your revenue as much, right? Whereas if you were to, you know, focus on the, 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 the product side, on the sales side, then there could be a proportional reduction in revenue from you cutting costs, right? So, Inevitably, you know, uh, that meant what that meant was that most of my transformation work was all, was focused on the GNA functions, where I would go in. You know, uh, I, I had experts that I worked with all the time, and we were able to talk to companies about, hey, how have you structured your finance department? How have you structured your HR? How have you structured your IT department? Right? Um, is that is that is that ideally structured for how you are looking to set up your company? Right? Is that ideally suit up, suited for you being able to? You know, create the 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 level of innovation that you want in your in your technology um, in your technology space, right? So th those were the the areas that we advised uh, customers on. Um, that's on the digital transformation side. I've also worked on a number of mergers as well, right? Where there's like large, huge, huge companies, you know, uh, twenty billion dollar companies that are merging, right? And and when they merge, you know, obviously. You know, uh, these are company uh, people from two different companies, two different cultures, two different ways of working, and you've got to make recommendations on how those companies can merge and become one, you know, united company, right? And so, um, advising on that also is is just a different challenge that you have to work with. Awesome. So, uh, what kind? Of, I think um, so the customer, their participation, the way they uh, engage is. Uh, like determines a lot of how how effective the solution is. So, according to your experience, what are the uh, like client type of clients that you will more like to work with? So, uh, and how like what kind of characteristics uh, that uh, uh, a successful transformation you know really landed and uh, achieved the goals? Yeah, I think the the most important success factor for a transformation to happen is the is the attitude of the people in the within the company right mm -hmm. if you like if you go in there 
and the people are very 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 hesitant to what you're what you're recommending right and it like um that change management is such a difficult process inevitably you know uh, you know in many cases the change that you you're trying to prescribe is just so much more difficult to sustain there may be there may be short term improvements but over the long term you might find that people are kind of backsliding back to old habits right the for for the the transformation to be successful like i said you need to build the capabilities as as you're going through the project itself right and so bringing the people along for the ride is very very important because it should come across that you know the the answer that you're coming up that that you're developing should not be a mckinsey answer it should be one that was co-created right by the client and you right yeah that, way, that makes sense yeah so the client own the client has ownership and so the client ownership helps drive that change helps uh, help sustain the change right and then even afterwards like if the client still needs help afterwards say hey you know i know we we put together this recommendation but you know in the in the six months since then this is what's changed in the market right our competitor has brought out this new product our customers have changed from x to y you know what 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 does that mean for us right and for so there we may look at it and say hey you know what let's just um, spend a week thinking about this and we'll we'll just put together kind of a, a short update on this recommendation in terms of how they can you know pivot on this uh, going forward right so but like i said the most important piece always is the customer buy in if that's not there it's it's pretty pointless almost so when you guys were making strategies solutions uh, whatever it is so do you also factor in uh, like a in, impact like influencing their probably leadership uh, or sometimes do you suggest people like uh, like suggest ceo to change one of these uh, his direct <laughs> or her direct <laughs> is that part of the plan I, I mean, I'm I'm sure that happens. Uh, you know, I I have not had the the opportunity to do that. <laughs> uh, um, <clears throat> in terms of uh, people, yes, like I said, from day one, you need to be you need to be working with people, right? Yeah, uh, it, it's a very poor answer if you go into a a steerco, right, and everyone is seeing that material for the first time, right? So before mm -hmm. the, the the answer is before the steer code, you need to go and work with some of the people in this in the, who are going to be in that room, and be like, hey, here's the answer that we we've we've, thought, uh, we've come up with. Do you see any challenges with this, right? And they'll give you their feedback, and you re revise based on that. And you have to kind of play that uh, game a little bit where you go and talk to each of the different people. So when you go into that that steer code at the end, right, and the CEO asks, hey. The, like the best, the best tiercos I've ever been in is one where you go in, you present, the CEO asks a, a, a question, and before you answer, one of the one of the clients answers the question, right? And because as far as that CEO is concerned, that means that hey, it's not this random consultant that I've never met that is that is telling me how I should run my business, but okay. it is. But it is Jason, who I work, I've been working with for the last 15 years, who All I right. have a great working relationship with, who has bought into this, what these guys are saying. And so they've come up with a solution together. And so I trust this answer a lot more. Yeah, right? I think yeah. that's that's a ideal engagement where mm -hmm. like you like uh, you, consultants are like the uh, the brain power that is uh, like rented. Uh, from these client companies and but yeah. the the uh, influence has been uh, saturated into the the uh, leadership uh, level at least that yeah. uh, people are buying to really push it forward yes awesome um so i, I heard of like you you also briefly mentioned like uh, you had a busy life in mckinsey like you spend uh, like regularly uh on average 80 hours a week and mm -hmm. uh, sometimes even up to a hundred hours. Yeah. So, how do you uh, manage a good uh, stamina, good energy level <laughs> to uh, really? I, I mean, this uh, compared with uh, such a great Microsoft work-life balance, I cannot imagine doing this for like four years. <laughs> so, yeah. do you have any uh, tips to share uh, as, in terms of this uh, self-management, basically? Yeah, I, in that sense, you know, Microsoft is, has been a phenomenal experience, uh, <laughs> especially from. From going somewhere where you're working 80 hours a week to 
<laughs> a lot less, you know, uh, where the expectation is a lot less, right? Uh, you can still work as hard as you want. You can still pull in extra hours if you want. But the expectation from, from everyone is that, uh, you know, you, you don't have to, to put that much in to get your work done. Um, I'll say that, you know, from a McKinsey perspective, McKinsey for me was always a little bit of an investment, right? Similar to the MBA, right? Because yeah. <clears throat> uh, with McKinsey, you're working 80 to 100 hours a week, right? Yeah. Um, but as you do that, it's, uh, you know, so you think of it as you work in one year, uh, similar to what other people work in two years, right? Yeah, that's a good way of thinking about it. Right. And so as a result, in many ways, your career progression is also similar to that, right? So the roles where you may not be able to get, you know, if you continued along the techno, uh, you know, the, the technical space or, um, you know, uh, in that role, um, after you go to a McKinsey or something like that, it provides that acceleration opportunity, right? So mm -hmm. that is one uh, one one thing that I thought was was phenomenal about McKinsey is that acceleration to your uh, to your uh, overall career. Uh, the other thing is that, <clears throat> as I mentioned, you go you leave home on a Monday, you come back on a Thursday, right? That that's the the standard consulting uh, practice. It's a little different these days because of you know uh, pandemic and people working from home and things like that. But in general, that's how it used to work. And I actually love that a lot, right? And the reason I love that is because it helped me uh, in terms of like my, my scope, right? And saying, hey, Monday morning, when I get on that plane, right? Or when I leave home, from that point onwards, you know, my life is like my McKinsey life, right? Thursday night, when I land back at home, from that point onwards, my, my life is like my family life, right? And so there was a very, very, you know, clear distinction between the two, right? Where, <clears throat> where when I, when I was away, like, if there was something, you know, happening at home, I'd be like, okay, you know, my recommendation for you is that you do this X and Y thing, but I can't do it for you there, <laughs> right? Whereas, <clears throat> and then when I come back home, you know, uh, I'm at home and I'm engaged all the time. And it's like, okay, I can, I can help with X and Y thing and, uh, you know, help set the family up for the, for the next week. Um, so that that kind of you know uh, focus on focus on work versus focus on family was was very very good because if you think about right now you know some of the challenges that we have with work life balance is that you know you work and then in between you've got you know family challenges that come in and you're like hey this you know family life and work life is kind of melding together and you're not sure where one ends and one where one begins right and so uh, that that was a lot more hard hardly defined or uh, uh, sorry solidly defined when we were you know, working as consultants, right? Um, so yeah, th those are some of the positives that we had. And, you know, I, I saw it as an investment, an investment in myself, an investment in my career. And so, um, and because like I said, the problems were different every time, it, it kept you mentally simulated that, hey, you're going to a new you're going to a new client, you've got a new problem to solve. Uh, how, how are we going to solve this problem in, a, in an interesting way so that you're able to deliver a lasting impact? Absolutely. I think there is a good saying from scientific research, I think, like, uh, so if you kind of uh, anticipate uh, the hardship, I mean, not hardship, it's uh, kind of more like a stoic way of living your life, but you can your strengths. Uh, if you have that uh, uh, anticipation, uh, the hardship is of like, they're all uh, very famous saying that uh, uh, pain is inevitable, but uh, suffering is uh, a choice. So right. if you have that uh, <laughs> anticipation, then it's a lot. Uh, I think uh, you don't feel as much anxiety and uh, you're more uh, better, um, you know, good uh, position. Um, and definitely that uh, have a tremendous benefit because you have uh, um, so many, like four years of experience, probably equal to uh, other people, maybe uh, even uh, eight to 10 years. So that has a uh, tremendous growth. Um, so I guess, um, so my, my thinking about uh, next, next question, uh, I'll share with you first. Uh, what kind of people uh, are, is, is a better fit for, like in terms of character, a better fit for uh, this consultant kind of working like McKinsey is mm -hmm. probably people more like structured, self-disciplined and more like a, have a, a, a compartment uh, kind of a lifestyle uh, that are tough, that uh, is able to, uh, to, to go through this uh, kind of uh, uh, a few years of marathon, is it? 
Yeah, I, I would say that that captures it. I think the the essence of a McKinsey consultant is one one you should have a, pro a passion for problem solving, right? If you don't have mm. a passion for problem solving, there's uh, there, there's no way that you're going to be successful, right? Mm. Uh, two, <clears throat> two, you should be able to uh, demonstrate leadership, right? So demonstrate leadership because you're you're working in many cases le leadership without authority, right? Because you're coming in there, you need to convince cl uh, clients that this that you are someone they should listen to, right? So uh, that leadership without authority is a, is a critical uh, factor that you need to have. Three, communication. Being structured in your communication, being structured in in how you are breaking down the problem and um, you know uh, aligning on a solution, right? And then um, ownership, right? So you need to have that ownership because, like, if you are the engagement manager, for example, you are the the lifeblood of that project. You know, the the leadership is counting on you to deliver on that project. The the associates and uh, business analysts that you're working with are counting on you to give them guidance, to give them a sense of direction, right? And so um, for all of that, you are you are the kind of critical cog in the wheel. Uh, and so here are those are some of the, the, the critical components that make up a, a, a McKinsey consultant. Um, obviously, there's also, you know, in terms of, you know, your career at, at McKinsey, there's also a, a lot of luck that, that, that comes into it, right? Because if you're, for example, in the, you know, um, in the travel industry, when uh, the pandemic hit, right, uh, and now suddenly all your customers, all all your clients, just like go away, and they're like, "Hey, we we, we don't have uh, any any um, you know any way that we can we can afford to have a consulting company here to to help us." Uh, suddenly, you know, the work that you used to work on is is dried up, right? And now you have to find something totally new, right? So. <clears throat> your success and your longevity in that career is also heavily dependent on your luck, on your timing, right? Of the particular kind of area of focus you've chosen. But like I said, th those core uh, skills or those core um, values that you have are also critical components in your success as a McKinsey consultant. Cool. Um, so I noticed that uh, our uh, we're running the time, so I'll make it really short and quick. So uh, mm -hmm. I, I probably we don't have as much time to uh, go into your current role uh, as a principal PM in Microsoft. But yeah. uh, probably I'll just uh, ask three simple questions. Three just sure. questions. So um, first question: How do you? Uh, uh, what, what's uh, so? What are the things your takeaways from uh, uh, McKinsey? I think you you uh, briefly uh, mentioned about. Uh, uh, communication and leadership so um, so i guess my question is how uh do you uh influence people uh with uh like influence or group people uh from uh, simply from this uh uh through uh leadership and and, and communication so i think you you are uh, very good at uh communicating with people uh, full of energy uh so how um, do you actually uh that, that's your your like one way of uh uh um to uh to have your own energy how do you uplift and uh, make the uh, the people around you to grow so have you thought about that sure so i think there's a number of different components there so one one piece you asked about is hey how do you you know get uh you know leadership without authority right so there different people are driven by different things right some people are driven by you know the 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 thrill of solving a problem, right? Other people are are driven by the um, the acknowledgement that they want to get about their their hard work, right? Um, mm -hmm. Other people are are driven by the impact of the work that they're doing, right? Mm -hmm. So people are, are are driven by by different things, uh, and it's important that you kind of understand, hey, what type of uh, uh, kind of approach should I use for different people, right? Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> When we when we're working with our, our our customers or with our partner teams, right? In those cases, in many cases, they have different differing priorities, right? And so in those cases, it may be a lot of discussion so that we can find a middle ground, right? And we we you know there may be some compromise we need to make. In some cases, they, there's compromises they may they 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 need to may need to make before we get to a point where we are like we're aligned on the path forward, right? So. Um, you need to have that that um, that ability to compromise, that ability to negotiate, and basically talk to and say, okay, you know, how about this? How about that? Um, and that's where you know having you know working with phenomenal people like like you 
uh, Ivan, uh, Sachin, and uh, you know very very knowledgeable people who are able to make that um, that decisions on the various trade offs that we have, right? And then on what basis do we make that decision that hey we, we proceed with X or do we proceed with Y, right? Uh, and phrasing it in such a way that our customers or our clients or our partners come along on the journey with us, right? And they, we we get to that that point uh, kind of together. Right, so that's 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 the that's the working with the external teams, with the internal teams. Like I said, you know, it's a lot about what what drives you as an individual, right? And so as a manager, I need to know okay, what what drives Hyming? Why you know what what will what is a, a key source of Hyming's happiness, right? So if I see hey Hyming is is really really happy at working with data, he's really happy at having his efforts acknowledged, and he's really happy with um, you know, getting the opportunity to have uh, even more like team leadership, or he's driven by being able to share his knowledge with other people, right? And, and uplift other people. You know, these are all things that, you know, as, as a manager, I would be like, oh yes, okay. In that case, Hyming, here's a component that, that I want you to own, right? And I want you to have the opportunity to share this with, with other members of our team. I want you to share this with other people in uh, across, outside our area too. Right, so that you are able to uplift, you are able to showcase your your skills and your knowledge, and that not only helps other people, but it helps you because you feel more satisfaction in the job that you're doing. Well said, thank you. Um, last, uh, uh, the second to last question. So, sure. where do you envision yourself to be in five years of time? Oh, How do you want a, to grow? <laughs> that's a that's a challenging question. I think <clears throat> you know. The uh, the driver for me is always impact, right? So it's um, if I'm ever in a position where I feel, hey, the role that I'm in, I'm not driving enough impact, or I don't have, I'm not being set up for success, or I don't think that I'll be able to continue to drive impact in this role, like I'll be the first person to leave, right? Um, <clears throat> I, I'm 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 fortunate in that, you know, with the with my technical background, with the you know Duke MBA, with the McKinsey background, and with my my Microsoft experience, you know all of those together gives me like enough uh, kind of tools in my arsenal so that I, I I'm able to go and tar and and target roles in the outside that could be very interesting, right? Um, not not with, just within WSD, but could be within Azure or outside Microsoft even, right? Maybe even in a startup. So. Uh, um, I, I'm not, I don't have an answer in mind saying, hey, you know, in five years time, I want to be a partner leading, you know, this specific area uh, and driving this specific opportunity. It's more of, hey, in five years time, I should be able to see, hey, from where I was five years ago, I can see how my impact opportunity is increasing, right? How we are able to drive incre increasing um, opportunities for um, <clears throat> for impact with our customers, with our partners, with um, with the overall business at large, right, and drive significant, you know, revenue or whatever the metric is that we are driving towards, so that you know I feel that I'm I'm adding more value to to uh, to the company that I'm working at. Well said, thank you. Um, so I think last question. Let's go to the uh, Slido and the C. Um, Oh, someone love you. <laughs> uh, yeah, that, I think that was you, I think. Uh, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Right. Uh, that was the test one. I saw that, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, it's uh, absolutely that people love you. <laughs> um, so um, you, you, you're you free to pick any question you want, basically. Um, I'll, I'll probably yeah. just use this one to screw. Um, sure. Oh, so which think, one? Yeah, I think uh, there's lots of great questions there. Uh, I think, um, are there any ones that are voted more than the others or no? Are they all equally weighted? Um, no. I think I will have several ties. Um, okay, then they're all tied for first. Okay, so I think um, what, uh, so I think some of those I've answered already in terms of, you know, uh, engineering to, to PM, um, MBA, uh, yes, uh, I, as I mentioned, MBA is, is helpful if you are looking to go more into the business side. Uh, if you're looking to progress along the technical route, so SDE to you know, managing SDEs, uh, et cetera, then an MBA is, you know, while helpful, not essential, right? Um, uh, yeah, and then, yeah, self-learning and online classes, for sure, right? Um, 
like I said, the MBA pro provides opportunity for networking and things like that. But, um, you know, especially if you're progressing in the area that you're in, then online classes are, are going to be a lot more helpful. If you're looking to make a career switch or something like that, then online classes, while helpful, are likely to not be enough, right? You may need to get more formal qualifications before you are able to make some kind of career switch, right? Mm -hmm. um, any tips for managing up? So if your manager is very micromanaging and goal-driven, I would say <clears throat> uh, the opportunity there is for you to almost micromanage them, okay? And what I mean by that is, um, there's opportunity for us to over communicate in many in, in many cases, right? Uh, so why why does a manager micromanage uh, you? It's because in some cases they may not there may be an absence of trust, right? They they may not be like, hey, I'm not sure that if I give uh, um, uh, George this this task to do, um, will they go and get it done on time? Will they be able to come back with the right answer? Um, will they be able to talk to the people that I think they should be talking to to get to that right answer and get them all on board, right? Now, uh, so to solve that problem, the, the, the manager will come and be like, hey, George, you know, who have you spoken to about this? What is your day one approach? What is your day one answer? Sorry. Uh, how are you thinking of, of, of this challenge? How are you thinking of that challenge? Have you thought of this? And that comes across as micromanagement, right? So I understand, I understand how that can happen. And so what, what you as a person being micromanaged should do is basically say, hey, I, imagine I am the CEO of my company, right? If I'm the CEO of the space, I have to over communicate to everyone to say, this is what I think the answer is, right? You have to also be a little fearless in that you are, you've got to you know, push that perspective out there and be okay to come, people coming back and telling you, hey, this is a good answer, but here's the five things that are wrong with what you've said, right? And then, you know, together you get to a better answer, right? But the point is that by over-communicating, by telling them, hey, here's the three people that I spoke to today, here are the insights that I got from this, based on this, here's how I'm changing my answer, right? You communicate that back to them, they look at it and they're like, okay, this seems reasonable, please continue, right? Once you start owning the answer and you start driving the answer, you will see that inevitably the manager that used to micromanage will start stepping back because this person is not micromanaging because they have nothing better to do, right? It's because, like I said, typically they have, they, they, they feel like, hey, if they don't do it, nobody else is stepping up to that position, right? And so by you stepping up, over communicating, being the CEO of that space, um, they see that, hey, you have that ownership, they can step back more. Well said. I think uh, we should have uh, a bigger vision of uh, thing to uh, be bold enough to have ownership. I think that's yeah. a very brilliant point. Um, so do you do you feel like uh, you want to pick uh, the other questions? Uh, I do respect the time. Uh, I uh, there's uh, definitely uh, I can uh, you I will have this uh, career up uh, page. Uh, people can leave more questions if you want, and uh, sure. um, we don't have to answer them all at once. Of course. Um, yeah, I think <clears throat> whether I had any regrets to do an MBA, I would say uh, no. I think so. One thing is the MBA that uh, like where you get the MBA also matters, right? Uh, because uh, I was lucky I got I got into Duke University. And so I was I knew that Duke University is a fantastic university and that, you know, the best companies come and recruit from there. Right. So if you are looking at an MBA and you're looking at different schools, be certain that the the career path you're looking to get into, that the schools or the the, that the schools that you are looking at, um, are uh, you know enable you to get into those industries, to get into those specific companies, right? It's it, it's a huge expense, right? So, um, you should see it as an investment. I, I I've always seen it as an investment, and it's an investment that has paid off for me for sure. Um, but you know, it's it's one where. And if I'd done it at a different university, I'm not sure I would have seen it the same way, right? Because I'm not confident that I would have had the same level of success, okay? So there the choice of school is very important uh, because the opportunities you have access to is, is gonna be significantly different. Uh, based on that, you know, um, based on my experience at least, 100% uh, no regrets from doing the MBA. Um, would do it 99 times out of 100. <laughs> cool. 
Awesome. And then, yeah, I'm happy to answer uh, the rest of the questions offline. Uh, if you, you uh, just uh, put the LinkedIn post and, and uh, show, share the questions, I, I'll, I'll answer those uh, offline at a, at a later, later stage. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Ivy, very much. Thank you for coming to Career Up Club. Uh, this is a great support for my volunteer work and uh, for this community. I personally learned a lot of, of your, uh, thank you for sharing with me your this uh, uh, problem solving driven approach and mm -hmm. your uh, uh, sharing your life story uh, since you were a child and uh, your ex exciting work uh, and uh, your methodologies uh, across your career. Mm -hmm. uh, this uh, fantastic. I think many of this uh, will inspire me a lot in my uh, future route paths. And uh, also, thank you, our dear audience, for staying with us this late. Uh, really appreciate uh, you attending this uh, uh, conversation talk. And uh, please, uh, if you haven't, uh, please uh, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel, uh, to our LinkedIn page, and uh, uh, join more of our online and offline events. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's late. I hope you have a good night. And uh, welcome to Career Up Club. Thank you. Thank you good night. Much. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you so much, Hyming, for reaching out. And uh, yeah, um, uh, all the best for the for the future. Uh, let me know how, how I can continue your support. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye -bye. Thank you. Have a good night. Thank you. Thanks.